Uh, I'm glad that today is family worship, that our young people are with us, because I want us to start with an experience that many of us remember. I think we can all agree, those of us that are adults, found this to be one of the most delightful moments in our childhood. And children, if you've not experienced this moment yet, I think I, think I could speak for you when I say you're just waiting for it to happen. It's a delicious moment. It's the moment you first win an argument with your parents. Decidedly, there's no doubt. They can't even retort back to you. It's wonderful. And even better, if you can use their own logic against them. So uh, this is going to come a shock to many of you. I had a bit of a mouth on me as a child. And uh, I remember I was arguing with my grandma. I don't know what about. It was something about a place. That will be important here in a moment. My grandmother did not take kindly to arguments, but there we were. And I was sure I was right. And she just got frustrated and finally said, David, would you just be quiet? How would you even know you've never even been there? And I said, Grandma, do you know where New York City is? And she said, of course I do. Why would you ask me that? And I said, well, I might be wrong, but I don't think you've ever been. (laughs) And I did not have the courage to make eye contact with her in that moment. (laughs) But I do remember looking at my grandfather and him being like, oh, 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 not wrong, but wouldn't have said it. Uh, And wouldn't you know that uh, sometime later I got a taste of my own medicine. I find uh, one of the most reliable ways of showing my children that I love them is by being silly in public. And um, the more that I can be around their peers while being silly, the better. And if um, being in public and being around their peers and being silly is a way to show them my love and affection for them, the best place to do that is at their school. And so sometimes when I am on the campus of my children's school, I like to do and say silly things that just might draw unnecessary attention to me and my children. And so one day, Kale was just a little guy, uh, maybe first, second grade, and uh, I heard was not, Dad, please stop. It was, Dad, keep going. This is hilarious. <laughs> and so I did it again. And this time, Kale grabbed me by the shoulders. Thanks for figuring this out, guys. And he says, Dad, I have asked you once to stop kindly. Now it's just a matter of respecting me. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Did you hear that? You, oh, man. Did we miss the punchline? That's too loud. He said, Dad, I've asked you kindly to stop, and now it's just a matter of respecting me. And I was like, wow, that's what I say to you. You can't say that to me, but it's this weird moment as a parent. Where- Thank you. Yeah. We're just going to fully lean into the awkwardness of this moment. Uh, because that's what we're talking about here, this awkward moment as a parent, as an adult, of going, boy, they're not wrong, uh, but I'm really angry that I'm, that I'm the one wrong. And we are starting that way this morning because it is the situation in which God and Moses find themselves, up on a mountain, arguing, and Moses using God's own language against him. God has been telling us over and over and over again, all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, that the sons and daughters of Abraham are God's chosen special people. And that no matter what happens, God will be with these people. And beginning in Exodus, we kind of begin to wonder that because here they are, entrapped in slavery for what we find out is 430 years, crying out to their special God and hearing nothing in return. But then, as we've come through this series, we've seen God go from inactive to active to world-changing, Pharaoh-dominating God that, that is choosing these people for a reason so that the whole world would know that God is, Pharaoh, that God is powerful and not Pharaoh. Uh, But now, as free people, it's been difficult 
They've journeyed through the wilderness. They've complained and complained and complained again. God has answered their complaints in Exodus with compassion and patience by providing for them. And now they have gotten all the way to the mountain, the same mountain on which when God first met Moses in the burning bush all the way in chapter 3, said, you will know that I am your God and that I am with you. When the people return to this mountain, here they are on this mountain. And on this mountain, Moses goes up and he enters the mystical cloud of God's presence. And there he stays for, we don't know, a month longer. And the people, the people down there at the bottom, they are becoming impatient and frustrated. And they say to Aaron, Moses' brother, where is this man Moses? As though they just heard of him for the first time. As though they're just waiting for him to come back so that they can go to the promised land. Not at all paying attention to the thundering cloud on this mountain where God's presence is meeting Moses. And they say to Aaron, make for us a God. And they take all of their gold that the Egyptians gave them as they pushed them out of Egypt, as they freed them forcefully, please leave. And as you go, take our gold and our silver. And they take off their gold and their silver and they give it to Aaron and they melt it down and Aaron makes a golden calf. And then Aaron creates an altar before the golden calf and says says to the people, bow down and worship. This is the God that brought you out of Egypt. Meanwhile, up on the mountain, surrounded by God's cloud of glory, Moses receiving both the Ten Commandments, but also the instructions for the tabernacle, the temple that will move with them, that will be gilded on almost every side with the gold that the Israelites have from the Egyptians, but now that gold has been melted down for another purpose. And God says to Moses, I know you're not aware of this, but I need you to go down a bit and look at what's happening to your people. And Moses goes down and he sees. And God and Moses are undone by the people, people's behavior. From now on, I want us to pay attention in the dialogue to the way that both God and Moses use the word you and your. You and your. God says to Moses, go down a bit, go down out of the cloud and see what your people are doing. Moses comes back and he speaks into the cloud and says, that's pretty bad. God says, I'm going to kill them all and just start over with you and the priests. Well, Moses says, God, I beg you, don't do this. Don't do this. Why would you bring your people out of Egypt? If you do that, the Egyptians will just look to the world and say, see, He's not really a loving God. He's not really a powerful God. He just brought them out of Egypt to kill them on the mountain. And then Moses uses God's own logic against him. He says, if you do this, how will the world know who your people really are? And what happens next is hard to translate. There's not a direct word for it. We're going to come back to this difficulty of translation in this conversation between Moses and Moses. And God, but some translations will say God was sorry. Some will say that God changed his mind. Some even say God repents. How can God repent? That might be hard for some of us to hear. We've been taught that God is all-powerful and all-knowing and all-loving. How can a God who is all-powerful repent? Repentance is weakness. Repentance, even if it's just for the thought of having done something, it shows that the person who had that thought was wrong. Can God be wrong? Can God think wrong things or want wrong things? This challenges our thoughts on God. Um, And then, as the conversation continues, Moses will change God's mind one more time. And again, we're confronted with the difficulty of what it means to be the people of a God who repents of his own thinking, who wanted to do something 
And then a mere mortal said, I don't think that's the right thing to do. And God listens. Verses 12 through 18, as Addie did such a good job reading, they're hard to translate. Here's why. There's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of repetition, specifically the word you. And some English translators might shy away from translating every single one of those words because, well, it sounds like Moses is yelling at God. I'm going to attempt a translation that translates every word. This is dangerous. I am not a Hebrew scholar. But I think this might be more accurate. I think this might sound a little bit more even like the psalmist's. Moses says to Yahweh, the personal name that God gave Moses, Moses says to Yahweh, look here. You say to me, bring up this people. Yet you, you have made, not made known to me who you will send with me. And you, you have said, I know you by name. And you, Moses, have found favor in my eyes. But now if And I beg you, I have found favor in your eyes. Let me know. I'm begging you. Let me know your ways that I may know you. So that I may find favor in your eyes. And look here, for this nation is your people. And God said, my presence shall go and I will grant you, Moses, rest. Well, Moses maybe really wasn't really satisfied with that because it's not quite a changing of God's mind. God's saying, yeah, I'll go with you, Moses. I'll give you rest. But the people I'm still a little bit at odds with, God is saying in some ways that we don't quite understand that he will go with Moses. He's not going to abandon Moses. He likes Moses. But no, he's, he's not going to the promised land with these people. Not anymore. And so Moses says, If your presence does not go, do not bother taking us from here. And how then will it be known that I have found favor in your eyes? Yes, I and your people. Will it not be by you going with us that the whole world will know that we are a distinguished people? And Yahweh says to Moses, this thing too that you have asked I will do because you, Moses, have found favor in my eyes, and I have known you by name. And Moses says, I beg you, show me your glory. And then God hides Moses in the cleft of the rock and puts God's own hand over Moses' face should he accidentally turn around and look at him as God walks by. And as he walks by, God removes his hand, and Moses is allowed to see God's back the shadow of God's glory. And then Moses goes down the mountain and his face is shining from having seen God's glory. And the people see the shadow of the shadow of God's glory by looking at Moses' face. And for the rest of his life, Moses has to wear a veil over his face should the glory of God be so great that it just knocks the people dead. What do we want to say about a God who changes his mind because of Moses, because of a mere mortal. Who is the Lord if a human being can change God's mind? The Lord is a lot of things. In this series, we have said that, uh, I'm doing a review here because we're coming to the end, we have said that the Lord is active. Even though it seems like God has left the people, God is in fact active and moving sometimes through people like the midwives, Shifra and Pua, we have said that the Lord is the impossibly possible. That is what the Lord's private, secret, special, personal name means. I will be what I will be, or all that is will be, all that will be, will be because of me. If something is going to be, it's because I am. We've said uh, the Lord is power, demonstrated through the plagues or the signs. We've said that the Lord creates and destroys that awful night where God moves through the Egyptian camp as a destroyer but creates in the same night his people. We've said the Lord is missional. The Lord is sent. 
We've grounded this study in the idea that God is still the God of creation and that, I, Paul, I love your prayer earlier, that justice is not a political term but is rooted in the values of God in creation. Justice is the world as God would have it be. And from creation till now, God is sending, which is what missional means. God is sending God's self in every way for the glory of God's special people. We've said that the Lord provides, even in a desert, even from a rock, the Lord gives water to the thirsty people. We have said that the Lord is in our midst. And we've said the Lord today, we're saying today the Lord is personal. And what's challenging about the last week, the Lord is in our midst, is that now in this text, the Lord desires to not be in the people's midst. The Lord desires not to go on with them, but God changes God's, Moses changes God's mind. And we struggle with that. It chafes against us because God should be all-knowing and all-powerful. But of all these things, that only get at describing God in part. The clearest thing that we can say about God in all of these things is that God is personal. God is relational. We can claim that God is all-knowing and all-powerful and still mysteriously in ways that seem to contradict themselves also say, but God acts like a parent that is willing to have its mind changed Because more so than being all-powerful and all-knowing and distant and cold, God is willing to make himself personal with Moses. God listens to Moses. I think we can be taken back by Moses' speech because it sounds like, like a child arguing with their parent, and that's wrong. Unless, of course, the parent is deeply invested in the child's success, even more invested in that than their own ego. The point where the parent can let go and say, yeah, I didn't like that, but you are calling me to these better purposes, to these better reasons. God listens to Moses, and God hears Moses. Moses says to God, if you leave us now, not only will we stop being a distinct people, you'll stop being a distinct God. There are not gods in the ancient world that choose a people and dote on people and rescue people and love people. There is only one God that has done that. And God, if you stop doing that now, Moses says, how will the world know that we are distinct if you leave us now? And God says, you're right. Every time we learn something new about God, we find ourselves in the perspective of realizing we're only just beginning to know the answer to the question, who is the Lord? So we learn that God is personal. We learn that God is active. That God is in our midst. That God is the impossible possibility. But what's the essence of all of that? The essence of all of that, I would say, is that God is personal. The clearest thing we can say about God of Exodus is that God will not leave this people. Is God testing Moses? Was this God's plan all along? Some people think so. That's not what the text says. The text says that God's mind is changed. That the God who separates the Red Sea, the God who moves through the Egyptian camp and kills the baby boys, the God who, who, who leads them through the desert, who does all of these big, powerful, God-like things, is also the God that covers Moses' face should he be harmed by seeing his own glory, who allows Moses to see his vulnerableness that is his glory. The story of Exodus is a story of a great God, a God over all gods, a king above all kings, who chooses not to be God without the people. Let me say that again. God chooses not to be God without the Israelites. Let me say it a little differently. God chooses not to be God without his special chosen people. 
one more time. God chooses not to be God without the church. One more time. God chooses not to be God without you. God is big. God is powerful. God could wipe us out in a moment. And God is closer to you than the blood in your veins. And God chooses not to be God without you. And we are taken back by a God who chooses to be so familiar with humans. The Lord is personal. In the beginning of Exodus, it doesn't seem to be doing much. But gradually, chapter by chapter, as God moves and acts and sends God's self and is powerful and is providing, God is becoming more and more known by the people he will not leave behind. God will lead them to the land flowing, overflowing with life, the land flowing with milk and honey. And I believe that we are living in a very similar story. Whether we acknowledge it or not, whether we like it or not, whether or not we decide to worship false gods, God chooses us, Northside. God has chosen never to leave the church. God will know the church, and the church will find favor in God's eyes. And we, I believe, will be the people that God reveals his glory to. And that we would be the people who just by looking at us, the world would see God's glory shine. But as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we will go about with unveiled faces. The world will see God's shadow of shadow of glory shining in our faces just like the world did with Moses because God chooses us. God chooses not to be God without us. And so I think if we draw near to the one that draws near to us, we will see God's passing glory from time to time. And when we, the people of God, look and see the coming glory of God, we will reflect that glory to everyone that we come across. And just like Israel, the world will know that God is God because God has not left us. Because we reflect the glory of God with unveiled faces. God knows you. God chooses you, and you have found favor with God because God is personal. And at this point, I want us to transition to our next series. This next series will get us to Christmas Eve, December 24th, which is a Sunday. Gird yourself. December 24th is a Sunday, okay? And as we march towards Christmas, we will start talking about the God that chooses to be with us. But this time, God chooses to be with us. God chooses to be missional. God chooses to be sent in a different way. God sends himself in the form of a baby. Once again, God sends himself in vulnerability to be with us the thing that I hope we hear in this coming series is that if the gospel in a word is love, we would look for where the gospel would be and we would realize that the gospel of love is with us. Emmanuel, the Lord with us. And I am going to challenge us to take these next weeks as we slowly inch through the first two chapters of the gospel of Luke And we as a church would try to hear these texts missionally. That we would partner with the God who is sent to us for us. And that we would be like that God. To this city, to our neighborhoods, for them. Because we are the chosen people of God who know God personally. If the world will know God, it will be through us. If our communities ever doubt that anyone is with them, or if they are like everyone else in our society and seem to be just mired in loneliness and desolation, it will be because the church has chosen not to be with them. It's because we've chosen not to be what God has been to us. 
but we might choose to be personal with the people that we do life with. We might choose to be on mission with God, sent to them. Church, would you stand as the worship team comes forward and receive this blessing? May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness. May he protect you in the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at all the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again to these doors.